Good morning, guys. How's it going? I'm Eric with Tilted K Homestead, and we are at Waters Farm. It's a living history preserve uh, here in Sutton, Massachusetts. Behind me here, you can see the original homestead that was settled in 1757. And this sits on, I believe, 125 acres. Uh, it's a beautiful site. If you follow our channel, you'll know that we come up here quite often when we are here at the summer camp with the dogs to let the dogs run around and uh, just get some exercise. And it's, it's really just a beautiful place. It's very quiet, very tranquil. There's something about it that's serene, for lack of a better word. But we are here today because Waters Farm is having a special event. Behind the original homestead here, they have historians and reenactors from many different periods in the United States. Uh, this event is put on by the 17th Regimental Continental Regiment out of Rehoboth, Massachusetts. And we will be talking to the director of that very shortly. Um, they are gonna have some demonstrations. We're gonna walk around all day, get to see all the events they have going on here and talk to the people and get a little bit of the history of what the men and the women of the Revolutionary War and the Civil War and I believe there's World War II uh, reenactors here as well and what they did and the struggles that they went through fighting for this country to make it what it is. This is just uh, a part of what we are going to have going on here at Waters Farm. We're happy to be collaborating with Waters Farm on this effort. And thank you so much to Bob Chauvin, the president of Waters Farm, and the entire board for giving us this access. So we're going to go over now, and we're going to see some of the guys over there. And... Uh, Come along with us. All right, guys. Not. We got one in. No. Cool. Well, yeah. Once we have some bacon juice. You know what I've noticed? I've noticed that if I was going to have a career back in the days of this founding of this country, button maker yep. sounds like a good job. Buttons were <laughs> worth money. Well, big oh, money because yeah. there was a lot of them. You look yeah. at that jacket right there. Yeah. And those and are simple wooden buttons. So I know. I ain't, I ain't worth a picture. And, and you I could just carve those right out, sit at home, carve out <laughs> buttons, and keep that in mind, folks. You never know what's going to be a million dollar idea someday. <laughs> Thank you, sir. You were 50. You were died at 51 years old. Pretty interesting stuff going on here today. I'm gonna switch arms. Looks like everybody's out learning something. Hi, you can come over and say hello. 
Good. How are you? And what time period are you representing? Uh, 1944, 1945. This would be uh, uh, early 44. Okay. To the end of the war. Okay. Uh, I'm the 1st uh, Armored Division. Okay. We're at the Battle of the Bulge. Oh. Uh, is that the Ludendorff Bridge? Huh. And all through Germany. And, and uh, did that armored division, did, was that part of D-Day invasion? No, it, the 9th Armored Division was uh, started in 1942. Okay. In 1945, at the end of the war, it was deactivated. Okay. They were part of the 3rd Army. 3rd Army, okay. But when, when they went to... Europe, did they go in during D Day or no, did they arrive? It was after D Day. It was after D Day. Uh, they arrived in Europe in 1943. Oh, okay. So, and then from 43 they were uh, marching all over France. Okay. And, uh, they went up to for rest and relaxation at, uh, at, uh, in the Ardennes Forest up there at Bastogne. Oh, okay. This is a good hit. Today, oh, fantastic! My uncle was actually there, and actually won a bronze star. Oh, really? Well, thank you for his service. All of this equipment that's laid out on the table—that is stuff that they would have in a backpack or on their person yeah. at all times, pretty right. much. They would, each soldier would carry a half a. But he is shelter. Okay. Which is this right here. All right. We'll get a shot of that. Together. And that's it all folded up. This is it all folded um, up. This is actually a World War II sleeping bag. Okay. probably did, just like Becker, because it doesn't Now that's, is that wool? That's all wool. I like to see rations. Yeah. Uh, this is basically what they had to eat in the field. And a piece of toilet paper. Oh boy. Four cigarettes. <laughs> crackers and a fruit bar and a can of meat well a stick of chewing gum well well I'll tell you it's it's important that we um, we remember this history and we keep passing it down well that's it if they, if they say if you don't remember history you're going to repeat you're it. bound to repeat it and that's very true and and I think that that's a, a very wise lesson yeah well, thank you, sir, so much You're for that. Most welcome. I appreciate it. We're going to walk around a little bit more, guys, see what we can see. Okay. Have a good day. Hi there. Hi. I am here with... Steve Eves. Hello, Steve. How are you? And I betray the ninth. U.S. Infantry Company E, Spanish American oh. Warfare. Oh, great! And uh, you, I see you have a couple of weapons here. Yes. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Uh, after the Civil War, the uh, U.S. military went away from muzzle loaders and began and made a breech loader. And in 1873, they came out with this model, sometimes called a, a trap door or 4570, uh, and it shoots loads one at a time one of these bullets in here and when you fire it it pops out and you got to stick another one in the, uh, the, the powder was black powder which meant that it there's a puff of smoke that came out okay. uh, when you fired it but this was used throughout uh, 1870s 80s and 90s and in the Spanish American War the state units that were called up they were they all carry these Oh. Because they had gone to a new weapon, the U.S. military, but they didn't have enough made up to, to outfit the state units. So the state units, for example, the 71st New York, which went to Cuba and was on San Juan Hill, yeah. carried this weapon. Oh, really? And state units that went to the Philippines after that were carrying this weapon. No kidding. This is a 45 caliber. And that was a government-issued weapon? Yes. And when the men and sons returned home, did they bring their weapons? Were they able to keep their weapons and bring them home and uh, utilize them at home? They would. The states and governments don't like to get lose those weapons. Okay. They reissue them, but once they their their life 
expectancy for military use had gone by, then they would sell them as surplus. Oh, okay. And this this next weapon here, which is a Craig Jurgensen, everybody in Europe was going to a lighter caliber uh, and um, being able to, to load multi bullets into a gun. Okay. And so the U.S. government, uh, 1892, adopted this Craig Jurgensen. And unlike this one, which can load one at a time, this one opens up, and you take these and you put five bullets, but you, 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 they're loose. You pull these out and you put the five bullets in there, and now you can load and fire with five rounds. In a bolt action. In a bolt action. It's 30 caliber, uh, so it's gone down with, and the, uh, the velocity is, is greater, and it's also smokeless powder. Okay. So the enemy can't see where you are, which they can with this one. Okay. Uh, and so they adopted this. The problem was that, that in Europe, the, the, uh, the bolt actions had what's called a stripper clip. So they had five bullets in a metal clip, and they could just push all five down in, and they could load it a lot quicker than this one where you got to pull out individual rounds. Round. Yeah. And so that's what led 1903 to the development of the O3 Springfield, which used the stripper. And was that not uh, called the bandolier? Is that in World War II? Is that a similar? Well, the Function. bandoliers, the, the, the uh, clips, the stripper clips were the common rounds. Right oh, okay. He might. We're just taking a little break. Uh, we're here early, so everybody's uh, everybody's kind of still getting oriented. Ken only cares about his own thing. <laughs> true. Well, um, thank you so much, but sir. You want to talk about use? These. Guns are the, the action is very smooth. Okay. They're very accurate. And once the O3 Springfield was adopted in 1903, yeah. these became surplus, and they became very popular hunting weapons. Oh, really? And they often you find them cut down. You know, they get rid of this wood, and, and so they almost look like a carbine. They did have a carbine version of this. Okay. But um, they were very common as hunting weapons for years and decades. And so that would be something um, that you might see a homesteader or a Absolutely. frontiersman carry for hunting and for self-protection. Absolutely. Well, that's fantastic. Well, I really appreciate you talking to me. That was very informative, and uh, I hope you have a great time here at Waters Farm. And I hope, I hope you can hear it after the... Uh... We'll figure that part out. Okay. <laughs> Thank you again, sir. Okay. Have a great day. Hopefully I'm in the shot. Okay, guys, so that was a little something about a couple of weapons here, and we're going to continue walking around and, and talk to some more people. Thank you. Okay, guys, so I am here with Eric. He is the event organizer. Yep. Say hello to all our hello, fans. Hello, everyone. Welcome. And he's going to tell us a little bit about the event and uh, the period that you're in and your regiment. Okay. So, yeah. why don't we start with your regiment? Okay. Yeah, I'm a member of the 13th Continental Regiment, which is a militia unit out of Massachusetts, uh, really out of Rehoboth, Massachusetts. Okay. Rehoboth, Massachusetts encompassed quite a bit of territory at the time. Um, a lot of the Massachusetts local towns nearby, but in also uh, some towns in Rhode Island. Okay. So it was a pretty big, uh, pretty big town. Um, I, I think at one point it was almost considered they were considering it to be the capital of uh, Massachusetts at one point, but they stayed with Boston because it had a port. Oh, fantastic! So uh, shows you how big Rehoboth was at one point. And, but and for those of us that are watching from either the United States or, or from, from New England, that would be the, the North Shore yes, exactly. of, That's what of the Massachusetts. North Shore, yep. That's great. And and how many people are in your regiment now? Uh, we have about, uh, it was from 35 to 40 members. Oh. Um, and it, it depends on the events and what we're doing, whether we get 
that large of a group that comes out. Uh, this is uh, this is one of the events where we have some good numbers come in this weekend. We have probably about 25 to 30 people coming this weekend. Oh, great, this is our great. Unit alone. Uh, but we, you know, typically for other events, we might average 10 to 12 people. Depends. Okay. Depends on the event yeah. and, the, and the turnout and stuff like that. Right. Well, that's yeah. great. Now, I noticed on the website, and I'm going to leave a link to the Waters website, and I will leave a link to your website. Yep. Do you have a Facebook page as we well? Do, we do, we it's, do. It's, it's actually 13th Continental Regiment, but it's spelled out, not that one three. Okay, so, okay, and I will leave a link for you guys in the show notes yeah, for that as well. Great. Yeah, they can, anybody um, can Facebook message us. So this event from the website is a free event to attend. Um, but there is, you have to pay for the parking lot. Right, yeah. And then the proceeds of that, yeah, do you guys receive any? No, of no, all the proceeds are going to the farm. We're here to just put on the event because we like history, we like talking to the public about history. And, um, you know, we want people to come out and visit with everybody right, in these different time periods. So you know, a timeline period is a lot of fun because you get to see a lot of different periods that you really not have ever experienced before. We have uh, you know, some folks here from, uh, that are Roman legions today. Um, you know, we have World War One, World War Two, uh, Spanish American War. So it's it's you, you got a lot of different areas, which is a lot of fun to oh, see that. And uh, it's there's just you know it's it's different than what we normally do, which is a Revolutionary War reenactment or a campment. But it's you know it's the same period over and over again. So you know people go from one area to another within the, the encampment. It's, all pretty much the same. We're all kind of doing the same thing. Okay. You know? We might be dressed a little bit differently because some have uniforms and some don't. Okay. But here it's completely different. Oh. Where, everywhere you, each place you're going to go is like a different time period. You know, their clothing is changing, the weapons are changing, what they do in camp is changing. Now their camps are set up very different compared oh, to what really? we do. So it's it's a lot of um, these these events are a lot of fun to do, and it's it, it, they're it's a great way to connect with others to uh, you know. If you're interested in you know, what, what we call cross dressing <laughs> yeah, in a yes, hobby, yes, you yes. know, if you go, oh, I do Revolutionary War this weekend, but next weekend I'm doing World War One or whatever. Okay. And there's a lot of reenactors that do that. So. And I would assume there's a great deal of community amongst uh, all of you all that yes. do this. Yeah, yeah, it is. I think a lot for a lot of people, the, the, the past oh, year, the 2020 right. year, was extremely hard on a lot of the reenactors because. A lot of them are very much people person. They yes. love seeing their friends. They love seeing others that they that they know in other groups and connecting and hanging out with them. Uh, so it was a tough year, and so you know, getting this event going this year was was a, was a struggle because of, we had to wait for a lot of the last minute stuff. Yeah. But the people that are here are so happy to be out finally and camping for real for a weekend. Yeah. Uh, it's it's great to see. And. and it, it was a little cloudy this morning, but really you couldn't ask for better weather. No, this it's really nice. The wind, there's a nice breeze right now. Uh, it's starting to clear up the skins of blue skies. Uh, my feet are drier than they were yesterday. Yes, they, yes, they are. <laughs> so it's, it's great, yeah. Getting All right. Done. Okay, so I have a few questions for you. Sure. Um, yep. What time period are you representing today? So I'm representing the American Revolution time period. So okay. anything 1774 on to 1781. Okay, that's great. And um, I've got notes because I had a lot of questions and I knew I would forget some stuff. So we've covered these ones. I'm going to move more to these ones here. And what was the occupation of the soldiers or militia before they actually became soldiers and militia were they conscripted or drafted or were they was it a voluntary yeah it was all voluntary um they the soldier was enli they would enlist for a certain period of time okay so it, it it depends on where they were going to enlist you know certain towns had different types of enlistments okay um you know Wash george washington wanted men to enlist for you know, not six months, but he wanted at least a two-year commitment, okay. two or three-year commitment out of the men, which is tough. I mean, you, you, to think that you're going to be three years away from your family in your home, uh, it didn't, 
it was hard for a lot of those guys. So, I'm sure it was. you know, some of the local towns, um, like our unit started out as, as a local town militia. It got blended in with two other units up in Dorchester Heights in Boston okay. after, this, uh, after Bunker Hill. It became the 13th Continental Regiment. And then they followed Washington down to New York City, okay. down to uh, Trenton and Princeton. And then the unit, their uh, enlistment period was up okay. after Princeton. And Washington tried to convince them to stay you know, another six months. Give me yeah. another six months. A lot of them left. The, our unit actually disbands after uh, early 1777. Okay. Um, and the unit, a lot of the members go into a couple different units. They sort of blend them into other units because obviously you're losing members here and there. You're losing men due to illness, sickness, uh, death. You know, so you, 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 boost the, you boost the ranks up again by taking one regiment that's falling apart and go, okay, here, you're going to take this many, you're going to take this many. Okay. And they would keep them, you know, they're Ma we're a Massachusetts regiment, you're going to put them in Massachusetts regiments. You're not going to take them and put them in a New York regiment. Just like, you know, the Boston Red Sox, New York Yankees rivalry, there was that, there was that type of intensity back then, too. Territorial yeah. rivalry. You had New York regiments that didn't really like Massachusetts regiments. You know, they, okay, they were, it was the same mission, same things that they were going for, you know, you know, fighting in a war and stuff like that, but technically, you know, they're going to argue. They they're didn't camp fight. together. Yeah, really. you, yeah. You, you, didn't, you didn't want to put them together because there was going to probably be some kind of, uh, you know, fight. Or okay. Now, um, as far as the makeup of the militia or the regular soldiers, uh, who, who were the homesteaders? Who were the officers? I'm assuming just from the history we were taught back in the 70s and early 80s when I was in school that the prominent town leaders yep. ended up being officers and more of the homesteaders, farmers ended up being the regular soldier. Is that is that a, a true statement? Yeah, yeah they, um, most of the officers ended up being either somebody of prominence within the town or somebody that had you know, that was wealthy and had a lot of money. Um, a lot of the militia uh, units would vote for oh. their captain. Oh. So it ended up usually being the guy that was maybe the most popular in the group. There we He's go. the most well-known in town. Let's make you the, let's make you the commander. And, okay. uh, and that's how it was. You know, the British had a different way of doing things. You know, some of the British commanders grew up in the ranks as kids and moved up and up. Some of them actually um, had their ranks paid for. So, oh, okay. you know, I want to be a, a major, you know, they're, you know, they might come from a public family, so they kind of get their rank paid for, so oh. the British go, yeah, okay, we'll take that money and we'll make you a major. Almost like a tax, yeah. you get know, a little something yeah, or, so they, they or kind of, uh, an earmark, as we call yeah. it around here. But the, the Americans had a lot of officers, and a lot of people think, well, all the Americans didn't, you know, they had George Washington, but a lot of the officers didn't have any experience. Not true. A lot of them did have experience. A lot of them fought in the French and Indian War prior to the American Revolution. They fought with the British against the French, so they knew how to fight. They knew how to train the men. The men were just not as well trained as the British, so yeah. there was a lot of training that still needed to be done. With the men. And that's where you know, us doing later comes in and kind of gets a, a, a regimental type uh, training program in that you know, starts with small groups and then builds up, builds up, and builds up. And Okay. become a lot better. Now, you're, you're, you're enlisted for a two-year period. Do the foot soldiers, the common men, are they allowed to get r, &R time off, say, at harvest time or at planting time? Uh, how would that work? Or were their farms and their homesteads pretty much left to their wives, to their to, to the people that are left at home. Yeah, they uh, they really didn't get time off uh, to go back. They it was pretty much left for the, for the wives and children, okay. uh, or for whatever family that was left behind to, to take care of it. To take care. Yeah, the men. I mean, part of it too is you know if you're uh, you know if you're in New Jersey or in, in Morristown in New Jersey, if you, you're not going to go all the way back to Massachusetts. That's a long walk back. Y right? Yeah. And, and and Washington knows that if he gives these guys, okay, 
go ahead, it's winter time, we're not, we're in winter quarters, we're not going to be fighting, go ahead and go back home, but come back. He knows they're not going to come back. That's right. So he has to keep them there. Um, okay. And it's, it's tough because a lot, of the, a lot of the men are just, I mean, they're poorly dressed now. You know, their, their clothes are starting to tatter, whereas some of them are, their shoes are really worn out. Uh, so some of them are actually freezing. You know, it's, it's, it's hard. And then I'm sure a lot of them would have loved to have gone home for six months come back in the spring, and a lot of them probably would have said to the group, yes, I will be back, and, and would have kept that work, but a lot of them just would have been like, nah, all right, I'm Well, yeah, <laughs> the, yeah, farming's got to be better yeah. than fighting wars. Yeah, exactly. But, I mean, the, the men that and sons and fathers that went off and did the fighting to basically start a brand new country, Right. Um, they sacrificed more than just their lives and their time like they could have lost everything. They could have lost their farms. They could yep. have lost family at home yep. um, and never even known it. Right. So that was quite a sacrifice for them to make. They yeah. must have really believed in their cause. It was. And, and the other, the flip side though too is, you know, yes, the the Americans could have lost no, the, those that were, you know, loyal to George Washington and the cause and freedom. They could have lost a lot if the war had gone south and then you know the British had won and you know we, it, there would have there would have been repercussions but there but there's something that I think we we all need to remember too is that those that were loyal to the crown also lost a lot too. That's so those true. Lo the loyalists or Tories, whatever you want to call true. them, lost a lot. Because there's a lot of those folks that were in you know major cities towns that actually had to pick up and leave after the war was over. A lot of them went back to England to right. Canada afraid of their lives because they thought they were going to be repercussions. Their house might get burned out. They might be killed. Their family might be killed. So uh, the war really affected both sides. And uh, if the British found out, say, an officer or somebody was uh, enlisted in fighting against them, uh, but the British occupied the territory where their home actually was, would they seize that homestead? Would they yeah. seize that home? Yeah and take it as penalty, and what would happen to the family uh, that was left behind? Usually, I mean, the family might get displaced, so, you know, the family might be told to go elsewhere. Um, and it depends, you know, the family might be able to find somebody else that's, you know, that's helping the cause, the American cause, and take them in. Uh, they might be able to fall in with another uh, family. It, it, it really depends. Every situation is a little bit different. Um, but yeah, American officers, I mean, officers, if they were captured on both sides, were usually generally treated uh, well. Um, and, and you do that because, you know, there's options to, you know, trade and swap prisoners for other prisoners and stuff like that. You didn't really want to treat them badly. Oh, okay. Well, that was very informative. Is there anything else you would like to add to that? No, I just, uh, you know, I think if you're watching this and you're, you've got an opportunity to visit uh, an historic event or a historic site, please do that. Uh, you know, I think it's just you know, so important to keep the history alive, uh, especially if you're if 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 doing an event like this, like a timeline event where there's different time periods. Go visit it. You're going you're gonna to learn a lot more than you would uh, in a book or textbook or, school or, classroom, or classroom. Yeah. classroom. I would like to thank you personally for doing this interview and we're going to walk around today and we're going to check everything out and talk to a bunch of people. Take care. Oh, no, I actually went company. By the left wheel. Mark. Oh, take care. Oh. Company. Prime and load. Really? What am I supposed to say? Company, make ready. Present. Elevate. Yep. Fire. 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 There we go. That was a little better. Fire. 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 Company, right about face. 
forward. Yeah, we're not right on the... Wow! 